this in a little bit into transportation. I think there's some interesting connections, especially here in the Bay Area, um, and we'll talk about that. And my work is focused on aerial robotics and specifically multi-copters. So I'll be talking about multi-copters and then I'll be looking at some specific aspects of them. Now I'm primarily interested in small autonomous flying vehicles. So if you think of multi-copters, you probably think of, for example, Amazon delivery drones uh, and the DJI uh, camera copters. And the reason these are interesting, I think, are uh, basically these here. Once you're moving in three dimensions, once you can fly, uh, it's much faster to move around, so you can move much more quickly. It's in some sense easier to move. It's easier to move because in 3D there are fewer obstacles. So you can imagine if I wanted to move from this side of the room to the opposite corner, and I had to move along the ground, this is quite a complicated path planning problem around all of the obstacles. But once I can move in three dimensions, I just move slightly off the ground and I have a straight line path um, to go there. And there's also another sense that it's easier to fly in that the air is somehow more predictable than the ground, right? So you can imagine if you move on this smooth, flat, slippery surface, it's a very different dynamic from moving on a carpet, for example, that might have hairs that get tangled in your um, gears, etc. Of course, there are some disadvantages as well to flight. So the most important one is that you are very mass constrained. Um, this typically means you have smaller range than you would ideally have. You have fewer sensors than you would like to have. You have less actuation in some sense. Um, and the real reason here is everything is bound by the amount of energy you can carry. Um, and there's some complicated nonlinearities in that if I want to carry more energy to extend my range, I am heavier and therefore less efficient, which means I need more energy, etc. Another problem is inherently anything that flies is dangerous. So the moment you're in the air, you have a certain amount of potential energy that you're carrying with you. Uh, and compared to something that's driving on the ground, there is no inherently safe action. Right? If I'm on the ground, I can just slam on the brakes, and this will bring me to rest in a somewhat predictable fashion. Once I'm in the air, and for example, my sensors fail, it's not clear how I should proceed um, to render my system safe. And finally, it's very hard to interact with the environment. So imagine you want to open a door. If you have a rover on the ground, you can sort of slap some robot arm on it, and this would allow you to manipulate the door handle. Uh, not that complicated. Once you're flying, this becomes much more difficult. Right? It's much harder just to solve the dynamics problem of how do I control the vehicle to do this, but also carry the weight, etc. is prohibitive. So we've seen quite a few sort of applications coming up for these small flying vehicles. Um, probably economically most interesting is the package delivery business. So there's a lot of you know, relatively high value mass objects want to sell pieces urgently, and these flying robots are really interesting uh, solutions to this problem. Now, Amazon, of course, uh, wants to deliver our packages. Um, this is one of their prototypes. DHL has developed a quadcopter that they've actually successfully delivered some uh, medicines uh, over the, the North Sea in Germany, um, and they've been doing more tests. Agriculture is a big potential area. You can imagine if you have a large farm that you want to gather information on, you want to understand what is happening on your farm. Uh, you can imagine having this effectively a small satellite that you can launch uh, to gather data uh, quickly and cheaply. Of course, the consumer market uh, is very large. DJI is selling hundreds of thousands of these uh, phantom drones where you can now take photographs from completely new vantage points um, with these vehicles. Another application area that I'll get back to a little bit near the end is using these drones as props, effectively, in entertainment. So robotics and entertainment has quite a rich history, uh, and you can imagine flying robots add a new dimension to um, entertainment. And what you see here is a stage actor interacting with a set of drones uh, that are effectively actors in this play. Now, for each of these examples, it's clear that the value of these systems really lies in their autonomy, right? So you don't want Amazon to have to employ thousands of pilots. Um, as a consumer, you don't want to spend a lot of time learning how to fly this thing. You just want to go out and launch it. Um, and if you're running a play, you don't want to have a bunch of pilots backstage. So you really want these things to be autonomous. And I want to talk a bit about some aspects of autonomy uh, in this talk. Now, you know, this was sort of the argument for small flying vehicles, but there's a lot of excitement about larger vehicles as well. And these are just some examples. Um, I think this Evolo Volocopter is the only one that's actually been flown, at least to my knowledge. Each of these is, in some sense, a multi-copter with different amounts of propellers and different architectures. 
Um, the Evolo is the most similar to a straightforward multi-copter. It has, I think, 16 propellers, um, but fundamentally it works exactly the same way as the DJI quadcopter. There's a Chinese company called Ehang that has at least made a lot of noise about the person carrying quadcopters. This has four propellers. Uh, Joby Aviation is located in the Bay Area. Uh, Airbus has also a concept which is also actually being developed here in the Bay Area. Uh, and the argument here is that you have some sort of electric propulsion system, you use the uh, techniques and technologies from these small vehicles, you scale them up, you put a person in here, and now you have this autonomous drone that instead of carrying a package, carries, carries a person, right? And anyone that's commuted uh, in the Bay Area is probably quite excited about the concept of you know, hopping over the bay in a flying machine rather than getting on the park uh, and taking the park. So I want to talk about today, first of all, just sort of broadly, a few points about autonomy, this will be quite general. Um, then I want to dive into two research topics. The first one will be a trajectory generation algorithm for quadcopters, which will be focused really on speed, both execution and computation speed. Um, and then I want to talk about some fail-safe algorithms. So how do we make these machines safer? Uh, and the failures we're looking at is mechanical failures specifically. So if you think about these autonomous flying machines, there are a few things that you need to be autonomous. You need some sort of actuation. You need to store uh, and use energy uh, to propel yourself for the actuators. You need to figure out where you are in the world. So you need to have some sensors and some algorithms that use these sensors. You need control and planning algorithms that allow you to move through the world. And then, of course, you need computation to use, uh, to run all of these algorithms on. Now, today I want to talk about energy a little bit, uh, especially because this allows us to tie the small vehicles and the large vehicles and to make some contrast between them. Uh, then I want to talk about the motion planning and the fail-safe control, which fits into the control as well. Now, before I get into the details, just quickly, how do these machines work? So, the simplest flying robot that you'll find is most likely one of these. It's a quadcopter. It has four propellers. Um, they're all pointing in the same direction. So, all of the four thrusts point in the same direction. And if you don't have one, you should go buy one. You can buy one off of Amazon for $25. Uh, <laughs> it's this large that you can fly around your living room, right? And it's a lot of fun. It's really interesting to see how far we've come was possible at this price scale. So how do they work? They have the four propellers. They are typically symmetric around the vehicle center of mass. And I can map the four thrust forces that I produce to a torque, so a three-dimensional torque vector, and a total thrust force. And the dynamics of these vehicles are dominated by this thrust force that I produce, the weight of the vehicle, and typically the drag and lift that I produce are small, because we tend to move at slow speeds. So thinking about the energy consumption of these vehicles. At practical scales, so this is anything that's large enough to be interesting, so not really small vehicles, anything that can carry payload effectively, the energy consumption is really driven by the mechanical power. So the sensors use negligible power, the computation is negligible. Um, it really is the mechanical power that we require. And a simple model of how much mechanical power you need, it's extremely simplified, but it's quite useful as a scaling law, um, is to treat the propeller as an actuation disk, so it's just something that imparts a delta of energy to the air passing through it. Um, and you assume that the air is incompressible and inviscid, uh, which is a reasonable assumption at low speeds. And then you get the relationship between the power that the propeller consumes, the force that you produce, and the size of the propeller, so the radius of the propeller. And it turns out that the power I need is sort of nonlinearly proportional to the force, uh, and it's proportional to one over the radius. So the takeaway message here is if I can double the size of my propellers, all else being the same, I'll use half as much power. So if I want to fly for long times, I want low force per propeller, so I want to push this down, and I want to push the radius of the propellers up. So where do I get the energy to consume for this flight? Typically for uh, the consumer vehicles, and in fact, I think all of the vehicles that I showed on this slide all of the concepts here are electric. And for the electric vehicles, we're thinking about lithium polymer batteries. And the reason that lithium polymer batteries are popular is they provide high currents and good, uh, good energy density. So we can power uh, the vehicles with them. I think one of the other advantages that's maybe overlooked sometimes is that this scales to smaller scales very well. So electric propulsion works well for small vehicles as well, compared to, say, internal combustion, which works well at large scales, but does not scale down as well as electric. 
The other thing is electric is obviously much less maintenance, right? So if you're a hobbyist, you don't want to deal with uh, changing oil, for example, on your uh, flying machine. So just as an example for some numbers, uh, this is one of the drones I worked uh, with a lot. It's called the Hummingbird. Uh, it weighs about half a kilogram, so one pound. Uh, and the propellers are about 15 centimeters large. Typically, you have a battery that provides about 2,100 milliamp hours, uh, and you can see about 100 watts in flight. And the power consumption by the electronics would be on the order of one watt. So this really is more than 99% mechanical power. And you can fly for about 15 minutes. Now, of course, the question is, as we scale up to larger vehicles, is this still the right architecture to use? Uh, Airbus would argue yes. I'm not sure I understand the reasoning there. So I'm just going to pose this as a question without solving it. But if you think of gasoline, um, you have energy densities that are roughly 50 times as large as with uh, these lithium polymer batteries. And clearly, if I can reduce the amount of weight I'm carrying as fuel, I become more efficient just by carrying less dead weight around, right? So it's not clear to me that you can ever really compete with these batteries uh, with things like gasoline or even hydrogen fuel cells. Now, hydrogen fuel cells, this is a very optimistic number. It excludes all of the machinery that you need to actually uh, convert to hydrogen, which is typically quite easy. So that's sort of an overview of how these vehicles would scale and how you might apply this technology uh, two larger vehicles, for example, a human passenger carrying uh, machines. Um, I want to now talk about two algorithmic research projects that work uh, on these vehicles. They're kind of independent of the scale, but the applications will always be for relatively small vehicles. So the first one is the problem of how do I generate trajectories for these vehicles. So one of the problems is moving from one point in the world to another point in the world, so how do I, what inputs do I need to move? And we are looking at a very specific class of trajectory generation problem, where we're trying to move from a given state to another state. So not just position to position, but position velocity, et cetera, to position velocity, et cetera. So the assumption on a perfectly homogeneous still atmosphere? Yes, uh, so we don't consider explicitly atmospheric disturbances. Um, these would be disturbances that the feedback would do then. But I'll get to the modeling so, so, so that's always an energy cost. So yeah, so if you had, for example, a, an environment with large wind fields, um, an interesting problem to look at is how do I generate trajectories that optimize for the energy usage, right? So you can imagine the straight line might be much less efficient than something that maybe is not as short, but uh, flies through areas of less wind. Uh, but that's not considered here. What we wanted to do here was come up with motions that are really fast, so very agile in the sense of moving as quickly as the vehicles can move, um, and that can be computed very quickly, so that we can run these on uh, embedded constrained hardware. And I mean by fast something like a million trajectories per second, right? So uh, just to give you an idea. So the first thing we need to do is we need to write down the mathematical model of the quadcopter. We will use the following model. So this is Newton's law applied to the quadcopter. So if you have the vehicle, the thrust all points in the same body fixed direction. Uh, for us, we have this be the vector 0, 0, 001. F1 through F4 are the thrust forces produced by each propeller. Um, then we have the mass of the vehicle times the acceleration is, of course, the force rotated into the inertial frame. So R is the rotation matrix. Um, and there's weight, which obviously acts in the inertial dynamics. The rotation of the rigid body evolves according to this differential equation where P, Q, and R are three components of the angular velocity. So the roll rate about the body fixed x-axis, the pitch rate about the body fixed y-axis, and the yaw rate about the body fixed z-axis. Um, we can collect these into a vector, the angular velocity vector, and the differential equation for the angular velocity vector is much more complex than the other two equations. So we'll get to this equation in more detail later, but the main point here is we have the rate of change of angular momentum, which is this term here for the body, for the propellers here. Then we have a cross-cupping term, which comes from taking a time derivative in a non inertial frame. Uh, and then we have the torques that act on the, the vehicle. And the torques would typically be the propeller forces acting at a distance from the center of mass. There's the torque from the propeller rotating, and as it rotates, it rotates the air, which causes a reaction on the vehicle body. Um, and then there might be additional drag forces, uh, drag torques acting in the vehicle. 
for this trajectory generation, we're going to neglect any drag. So we're going to neglect the drag torques acting on the body, and we will have no drag forces acting on the body either. And the reason for this is allow us to come up with computationally cheaper algorithms um, that we can run fast enough to reject these as disturbances if they come up. Now the trajectory generation problem is to find inputs that guide the system from one state to another. This is a very ugly differential equation, so what we do is we ignore it. Um, and we are allowed to ignore it for a very specific reason. So these vehicles tend to have the actuators at a large distance from their center of mass, which means they can produce hard torque. So the same as a very low of inertia. The low torque of inertia means that it can produce very large angular accelerations. So what we do is we decouple the control problem into the control of the angular velocity, and we can have very small time scales on this controller, and then we have control of the rest. And the rest we can then collect into much simpler differential equations. So we collect the sum of the four forces scaled by the vehicle mass into this number C, which is a scalar, and we treat the three angular velocity components as inputs. And now we want to come up with these four numbers to guide the systems from one state to another, which is much simpler than the previous equation. Now to get the speed that we want, we will do this in two steps. And this is kind of different from the typical way that you might generate trajectories. And what we do is we generate a motion without looking at any constraints as a first step. And then once we have motion, we evaluate whether it is feasible or not, whether it violates any constraints or not. And we'll see for this sort of system that there are some powerful properties that allow us to do this extremely quickly. So we can split this up and we can do this at a high enough rate that if we have freedom in the problem, this is still a useful approach. So for the first step, we do the trajectory generation, ignoring the feasibility constraints. Now we've already simplified the problem by removing the angular velocity dynamics. We're going to simplify it even further and plan a motion in the jerk of the axis. Now the jerk is the third derivative of position, so it goes position, velocity, acceleration, jerk. Um, and it turns out that if I do this, um, I can recover these inputs that I'm interested in uh, in a straightforward fashion. And this is related to differential flatness of the system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, for each spatial axis, I'm going to plan a separate motion in its jerk. Once I've solved for this jerk trajectory, I can recover the total thrust that I need from the acceleration along the trajectory and the angular velocity that I need along this trajectory from the thrust and the jerk along the motion. Now one thing that happens is the yaw rate, so one of the components of the angular velocity, has disappeared. And this has disappeared because the vehicle is symmetric as far as the dynamics are concerned about its thrust axis. So you can add any your rate you like to this equation and it doesn't matter for this. So we'll now plan in this jerk input uh, and then we can recover the angular velocities and the total thrust. So how do we generate the motion for the jerk? We solve this as an optimal control problem where the cost function we're trying to minimize is this Euclidean norm squared of the jerk over the motion that we're trying to make. The reason we do this is because it happens to be easy to solve more than anything else. Uh, and one of the reasons that it is easy to solve is the Euclidean norm squared separates into the three components squared. So I can solve the optimization for each spatial axis independently and the result is still optimal for the combined problem. Um, and because the system is a triple integrator and I'm solving for a quadratic problem, this is a really straightforward optimal control problem to solve. Right? So I can do this in close form. But it turns out that it's a useful answer in this sense here. So if I minimize the jerk squared, I'm also pushing down an upper bound for the product of the inputs. So this is kind of a strange product of the thrust and the angular velocity. Um, but what this means is that the trajectories that minimize the jerk tend to be nice trajectories, right? So they tend to have small inputs that we actually care about. And we can do this in closed form as a polynomial. So once you give me problem data, I can give you the trajectory that optimizes this cost function in almost no time at all. All I need to do is evaluate the matrix multiplication. Now this was only the first part. The second part is then actually determining is this a feasible motion or not? So does this violate any of my constraints or not? So the constraints we're interested in are do I crash into surfaces? So I'm going to crash into the floor or into the wall or into the ceilings. Um, and am I input feasible? Where input feasibility is measured as does the thrust I produce lie within some minimum and maximum bounds? And is the angular velocity that I can 
bound people. Now, let me just explain why these bounds exist. So clearly the maximum thrust is kind of intuitive. There's a maximum amount of power that I can draw and this relates then to a maximum amount of thrust that I can produce. The minimum thrust is positive number, which is related to the fact that the propellers are designed to operate in one direction only and the electronic speed controllers that run the propellers typically do not operate well below a certain threshold speed because they need to detect the zero crossings to uh, estimate the speed of the propeller. So there's sort of a minimum speed at which I can run the propellers reliably. This then translates to a minimum amount of thrust that I can produce that's positive. The angular velocity is constrained on the one hand by the limits of the sensors, so the rate gyros that I'm using to measure the angular velocity saturate typically at about 30 radians per second. Um, so you cannot go faster than that if you still want to repeat that control. Um, but there's also sort of a limit at which aerodynamic effects that we've neglected become important. So you can sort of tune that limit based on these two factors um, to give you the numbers that define feasibility. Now I just want to give you a cartoon of how we test for feasibility in a fast way. So what you see here is for a trajectory a motion that starts at some time zero ends at some big T. We solve this polynomial for the jerk along the motion. This jerk is then mapped in some nonlinear way to the thrust along the trajectory. This is the dotted line here. The limits we have are the blue lines. There's a minimum thrust and a maximum thrust. What we don't want to do is we don't want to evaluate this dotted line over the motion. Right? That would be computationally expensive. So what we do instead is we can compute in a very efficient way bounds on the thrust, so an upper and lower bound that are conservative. Um, and we can test these to the limit. So what I've done here is I've computed these bounds for this trajectory here. What happens is for this specific case, the upper bound is more than the maximum allowed, the lower bound is less. So I don't know that this is a feasible trajectory. What I now do is I divide this into two parts and I repeat this process. And as I make the time that I'm looking at smaller and smaller, this feasibility test becomes tighter. So basically the conservatism uh, in the test reduces. And what we see after one step, I can already say that the first half is definitely feasible. The second half is definitely feasible with respect to maximum, but not the minimum. And then I keep repeating. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to test for the feasibility by evaluating this trajectory at only a handful of points. Right? So I don't need to evaluate at some fixed grid of uh, time points. So, okay, now we have this thing that we can generate motions quickly and we can test the feasibility. What is the script for? So the example problem we came up with to demonstrate how fast we can do this uh, is the following. So what you do is you have, a, you have a human who is throwing a ball, and then you have a quadcopter with a racket attached to it that's trying to intercept the ball and hit the ball back towards the human. Now this problem is challenging because the motion that I'm going to execute. Uh, so it has a very real-time aspect, and it's also interesting because it's something where we have an intuitive feeling for how it works, right? So everyone has played some tennis, and we know how easy or hard it is to hit the ball towards the target. It's useful for this kind of, or I mean, our algorithm is useful because there's a lot of freedom in this problem. So you can hit the ball in many different ways that will still achieve this problem. Uh, that will achieve the goal of hitting the ball back towards the target. So how do we use the algorithm? We run the system at 20. sample the space of possible motions that would achieve the goal. So once we've done this, we found that red candidate was the one that had the lowest cost while remaining feasible. So we execute that first 20 milliseconds from that trajectory as an input. And then 20 milliseconds later, we repeat this process. So what you see here is the feedback loop in action. So you just see the optimal trajectory and the optimal return path for the ball. And you can see as the ball is flying, we get more information about the ball's flight. We get information about disturbances, like I'll get to in a second, disturbances actually on the vehicle, uh, and we replan continuously, so we can react to these disturbances as they as they feel. Uh, yes. And at least the, well, the ball's trajectory is deterministic, not stochastic. Um, well, it is 
you know, there is aerodynamics and so on, so it is hard to predict. The primary stochasticity comes from the uncertainty in the state of the ball. So this is a ping pong ball, uh, which means that it's very light for the amount of drag that it has. So it's kind of hard. To, there is quite a bit of variance in the prediction uh, of the ball. Something that we put premium on an earlier slide. That's true. We don't actually, we don't explicitly account for that, but that would be, I mean, there's two ways to think about this. Either I wait longer so I have more information about how it's going to fly, or I act quickly so that I allow the uncertainty to grow less, right? So I'm not sure what the optimal would be in that respect. Um, right, so, okay, so this seems like kind of a, a strange toy problem. Uh, who needs this? Uh, that's a fair point, but there is a, you know, this notion of quickly generating trajectories is useful in many other circumstances. Imagine you want to land your drone on a moving target. So let's say your delivery truck is driving along the road. Uh, you want to intercept this delivery truck uh, to land, so you can charge your batteries, for example. It's exactly the same problem. You have substantial freedom in choosing the point along which you want to touch down, um, and you can use this exact algorithm. What happens if you're flying uh, through the air and suddenly an obstacle appears? For example, a bird is crossing your path. Again, there's substantial freedom in the motion that you execute to avoid intercepting the bird, right? So in that case, you want to avoid interception. But again, it's kind of there's a lot of freedom in this problem. So using uh, this sampling-based generation, which is so fast, allows you to sample from this uh, large space very quickly. Okay, now I want to talk a bit about safety. Um, you know. If you think about these vehicles flying over our cities, delivering packages, or just hobbyist drones, a big concern is how safe are they? And what happens if something goes wrong? <coughs> now, one of the things that might go wrong is you know, your neighbor might become annoyed with what you're doing and shoot at you. Right? So you can say, I want to make them more reliable, but reliability is not enough. Right? So there will be situations where uh, even extreme reliability fails. Now, one approach to dealing with such potential failures is redundancy. So this is the DJI copter, this is the hexacopter, so that's the same idea just with six propellers. Uh, the original Amazon concept had eight propellers. This is a prototype for the Evolo, which had 16 propellers. Um, and you can imagine, as I add more propellers, the vehicles become safer in some sense, right? And they become safer in the sense that the failure of any individual component matters less for the whole system. <coughs> There is, however, a sense that they, you know, counterintuitively, the more components I have, the likelier it is that one of those components fails. So it's easier to maintain a single engine airplane than a twin engine airplane, because I only need to do the job well once rather than twice. So we ask ourselves, is there an alternative to this? Can I get by with fewer components? Uh, and the argument is fewer components would be cheaper, they require less mechanical structure to hold them together, so it would be less mass. Uh, and there's a lower probability of a failure happening in any given flight. And the fundamental question is, can we hover with fewer than these propellers? So why is this an interesting question to ask? Um, so we looked at these four propeller vehicles. I have four inputs, the four thrust values, and I can map these four thrust values to a three-dimensional torque, so the three components of torque, and the total thrust. And importantly, for any amount of total thrust, I can make the torques go to zero, right? So I can produce a constant thrust and have zero torque. If I remove one of the propellers, this is no longer true. For a given torque vector, the thrust is fixed. Or alternatively, if I fix the thrust, I have a uh, loose degree of freedom in the torque. And specifically, for a given amount of thrust, I cannot make the torque go to zero, right? So whatever I do, there will always be a torque imbalance which causes a, a rotational acceleration on the vehicle. So the key idea to still allow this to fly is to let the vehicle rotate, right? So once we let the vehicle rotate, we'll see that some additional dynamics <coughs> here which allows to still control uh, the flight of the vehicle. So the modeling in this case is very similar to what we saw before. The only difference is now we sort of allow an arbitrary number of propellers. We no longer require symmetry. I will still restrict myself to cases where all the propellers are pointing in the same direction, right? So you can imagine crazy vehicles where the propellers point in different directions. Uh, that's a different problem than the one we're looking at solving. The acceleration dynamics are exactly as before. Um, this now we sum over an arbitrary number of propellers. The rotational uh, orientation matrix evolves the same way. And the rotational dynamics are as before, again, just over an arbitrary number of uh, propellers. And we'll see that the key to making this work will lie.
If I now massage this a bit, I get that this translates to the vehicle having an angular velocity that is parallel to gravity, so it's either rotating with angular velocity up or angular velocity down. And the position trajectory of the vehicle is either constant or it's moving in a horizontal circle, right? So it's sort of circling a point. So what do these solutions look like? So if you have a quadcopter, uh, which weighs five newtons, so this vehicle we're working with, if I have four propellers, you have each vehicle producing, uh, each propeller producing a quarter of the vehicle mass, so about 1.25 newtons, um, and you obviously have zero angular velocity, right? So I can stand still in there. If I now remove one of the propellers, I need to increase the thrust forces, so we need, we see these two motors now produce two newtons instead of 1.2. And we notice that the vehicle has to rotate quite quickly. So it's rotating at roughly 20 radians per second, which is something like three hertz, right? So three rotations per second. I can go ahead and remove yet another propeller. So now I have only two left. We see the forces go up, kind of obviously. Uh, and the speed with which the vehicle rotates goes up as well. So now the vehicle rotates at something like five hertz. Um, I'm showing only these specific solutions because these are the ones we can achieve in experiment. You can compute on paper the solution for two adjacent propellers having failed and for three propellers having failed. The problem is with the experimental system we had, we could not actually replicate this in flight because we cannot produce the amount of thrust force we need. But each of these we'll see in flight uh, in a second. So we've derived that there are equilibria for these systems. So even if I lose one of the propellers, I can achieve a state that I can keep. The question is, can I keep the state in the face of um, disturbances? So for example, noise uh, and aerodynamic disturbances. I'm going to look at this case where I've lost two opposing propellers. The reason for this is uh, it kind of is the most elegant solution because it has lots of nice symmetries which come out. Um, and it's also kind of intuitive why this would be difficult. So each of these propellers is rotating in the same direction, which means that they produce uh, reaction torque in the opposite direction on the vehicle body. So the vehicle will be rotating in the opposite sense from the propellers. And by the differences between these two forces, I can produce a torque around this axis, right? So the axis that bisects the two motors. There's no input that can produce a torque along the axis that connects the two motors, though, right? So it's clear that this is a direction that I cannot directly actuate. But I can still control this axis by exploiting this coupling term here, right? So this nonlinear coupling term, omega cross I omega, um, this allows me to affect this axis where I don't have an input anymore. And the way this works intuitively is you will have the vehicle rotating very quickly around its thrust axis. With the two forces, the differences between the two forces, I can create an angular velocity around this axis that, can, that bisects them. These two will intersect, will interact with omega cross I omega to cause an angular acceleration in a third linearly independent direction, which would be this axis now. Uh, and then through this, I actually have an input into this, or I have an effect on this direction of the system that I can output. Now, if I'm not rotating, this is not possible, right? So that's sort of the easy way. If you look at a quadcopter, if you remove two of the propellers, immediately there's nothing you can do. You have to have the vehicle rotating. Okay, so just to show you what the math looks like, um, if we look only at the attitude system, so only look at the orientation of the vehicle, and specifically the thrust direction. So the thrust direction in the wall frame, if I look at the x and y components, and two components of angular velocity, the roll rate and the pitch rate, um, I can try to set up the linear system, the linearized system, uh, with the input being the difference between the two forces. And if I write this down, I get this uh, system here, where the dynamic system matrix is quite sparse. So we see it has ones and zeros, and then only two interesting numbers, a bar and r bar. R bar is the speed with which we're rotating, so that's sort of the steady state yaw rate. And A bar is this cross-coupling constant, which is a function of the mass distribution of the vehicle, the speed of the propellers, and the speed with which the vehicle rotates. What's nice is this is time invariant. This is time invariant because we've restricted ourselves to solutions that are constant from the vehicle's perspective. Uh, and that means we can apply our favorite LQR tools to control the vehicle and to analyze uh, controllability, etc. 
And it turns out that there are two interesting cases where you can build such a vehicle that would not be controllable in this way. Um, and they're related to having mass distribution like that of a sphere and having a pancake-like mass distribution, so like a flat object. So if you were building a quadcopter and you wanted to be safe in the sense of uh, surviving a failure, for example, your Amazon, you might want to make your mass distribution somewhere between these two extremes, right? Because then you're, uh, in some sense, pushing yourself farther away from the uh, singularity. Okay, so this is the theory. We then apply this theory in experiments. So what you'll see here is a quadcopter experiencing a failure and then using this to recover from that failure. So this is an onboard view of the vehicle. The other vehicle is just filming, so you can ignore it. So we're looking at this quadcopter. This is the camera looking out at the right-hand side propeller here. Uh, and there's a nut missing from the motor. So this motor should be held down with a nut, but the nut is missing. So what happens is eventually this vibrates loose, the propeller falls off, and then clearly we can no longer produce a, uh, a thrust force with that <coughs> motion. Um, and what happens then is the vehicle detects the failure and engages this alternative way of controlling itself uh, to return to its, its original position. So this is the same thing in slow motion. So we're looking at this propeller here. So we see the failure happening. The vehicle then starts to build up this rotational speed. Once it is rotating quickly enough, it can use this directional dynamic mode uh, to control its thrust direction and return to its original position. So you can use this as a safety system, adding it to an existing quadcopter or to design new quadcopter as a safety but you can also build new kinds of vehicles using this idea. Um, I'll very quickly talk about this vehicle. This is a two-axis vehicle, a two-propeller vehicle. It's a quadcopter that just chops the arms off. Um, and this was mostly just sort of a toy problem that we were playing with. But it turned out to be really difficult to do. So these are some experiments that did not work. Um, and I think this is mostly sort of a, a cautionary tale um, because it should have been really obvious that this does not work. And the reason this should have been obvious is this vehicle is rotating around its middle axis of inertia. Uh, so it has a very small moment of inertia around this axis, it has a large moment of inertia around this axis, and a small one around this. And if you've ever tried to throw your phone, you know that there's one axis where you cannot get a nice rotation. And that's exactly what we're doing here. And this vehicle is open loop extremely unstable, um, which we found out the hard way. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, using the powerful RQ articles, it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking you solved the problem without looking at the dynamics. And we found out the hard way that sometimes it pays off to really look at the dynamics. You can also build sort of extreme vehicles. So this is, we argue, the mechanically simplest controllable flying vehicle that exists. Conceptually, it's a brick with a propeller tied to it. Now, it's a very specially designed brick that I'll talk about in a second. But what it exists, what it consists of is the motor and propeller in this corner, the battery here, and then the electronic system here. And each of these three parts weighs roughly the same amount. Now what does this do? What you see here is it's flying, it's holding a position, uh, and you can see sort of this rotational motion, horizontal circle that it's flying about, right? The thrust force is inclined slightly, so that's kind of obvious, but you need to have this uh, to maintain a position. How do you launch this vehicle? You can throw it like a frisbee, it turns out. So this is a, the doom view of how you fly. So what you see here is you launch it, and then you can use this magic pointer to tell the vehicle where to fly to. <laughs> uh, this is mostly to demonstrate that this vehicle really is controllable in position, right? So it can control its position anywhere in the world, even though it has only a single action. Now this vehicle, using the lessons we learned from this two propeller vehicle, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to replace the mass to make it easy to control. And the way we thought about it is let's make it like, like an equilateral triangle and just move one of these objects around, one mass of objects around. So we take the position of the position of the battery and we move the electronics around and see how does the position of the electronics affect the robustness of the system. So this is sort of a heat map of robustness where the probability of uh, failure is encoded as a color. So you have this very clear boundary that if I move the electronics over this hill, I'm going to be in trouble and I'm almost certain to crash given we assumptions. However, there is a nice value here. If I push the electronics over there, I get a much nicer design. 
And this sort of indicates this is a very sensitive uh, kind of vehicle to build. So this might not be a useful vehicle. Uh, yeah. You can also use the technology to make vehicle safer, right? And because this is something where we have a patent paying on that we've licensed to a commercial partner. And what this commercial partner has done is effectively take two of these two propeller vehicles and glue them together, right? What you have now is you have the nice mass distribution of a quadcopter, but you have two fully independent machines. Each of these machines can fly stable. Each of these machines has its own battery, its own electronics, its own motor controllers, uh, and its own motor. So it's fully redundant. And clearly, any single component can fail on one of the vehicles, and the other one can just carry you home, right? This is completely safe with like battery failure, sensor failure, uh, the microcontroller can fire. Uh, anything happen, and you can bring yourself down as long as the fire is slow enough that you have. Tunes are extremely annoying, so if you listen to this twice, you lose your mind. Mm -hmm. um, but then at some point, suddenly, you know, things, the, the, the stage comes to life. The story is cheesy, so you have a love triangle, uh, you have the main uh, male love interest and the female love interest, and the first time they kiss, so the world comes to life, and magic happens, and things start to fly. And then the drone copyright laws are kind of draconian, so I can only show you this clip from a different clip. Um, but you get the picture, right? So you have eight of these drones flying eight shows per week in front of an audience of 2,000 people each time. So uh, you know, here you really care about the reliability. Uh, and with the system, we believe that the vehicles are reliable enough. So I just want to point out that what I've shown has relied on the inputs of many people. Um, so a lot of it, uh, my PhD advisor, Raph Andrea, the experimental system in Zurich, where most of the experiments were run, um, many people have helped in many different ways. And then a bunch of students worked with me, especially on these novel vehicles. Some of them had more painful projects than others, um, but uh, they did most of the work designing and building the, the new types of vehicles. Um, and in the company, Verity Studios, that does this Broadway show, uh, this was, I think, about four months into the company. It's grown quite a bit now, uh, but they did most of the work of actually building and running the system, and of course there's a lot of reliability engineering that has gone into it beyond what I've shown. Which of that person is sucking on the layer of that? Seems like the discriminant. <laughs> he's not a vampire, he's just <laughs> standing in poor light. So, <laughs> um, so I've talked a bit about sort of general autonomy of these systems. Um, I think there are important scaling laws to be kept in mind, especially if you think about this is a, a scale of transporting people. Uh, and I'm not convinced that electric propulsion is the right way to go. And I'd actually be quite interested in looking at um, alternatives, uh, for example, internal combustion, also at sort of medium scales, uh, whether that might be useful uh, for these systems. I talked about, about this trajectory generation algorithms for the quadrocopters. Uh, 
Um, here the goal is really to be fast. The speed allows us to react quickly to disturbances. Um, even though the model was quite simplistic, because we can use this in a feedback way, we can check these disturbances uh, quite well as well. Then I talked about the rotating vehicles and how if we allow vehicles to rotate, we get the additional modes of safety, right? And you can imagine if you now want to put a person in one of these, you might prefer to have this safety uh, built in. You might feel quite unwell if it lands you in this rotating way, but certainly it's preferable to crashing. Um, and then you can build some lower vehicles as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.